Hi everyone and welcome to the New Human Movement. I'm Michele Zanini. My colleague Gary Hamill and I are delighted to be in conversation with Florent Menegot today. Florent is the Chief Executive Officer of the Michelin Group, the largest tire maker in the world, with 124,000 employees that churn out over 200 million tires a year and a number of specialty products and services, including the world-famous Michelin Guides. Florent joined the company back in 1997, and before becoming CEO in 2019, he spent five years as Michelin's COO, and he was instrumental in his role in nurturing and, and then helping to scale Michelin's ambitious responsabilization, uh, which is a French word for empowerment, and frankly sounds better than empowerment, efforts, and, 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 which have, and these efforts have dramatically increased the authority and the accountability of uh, frontline workers and reverse the ratchet of centralization across the company. So Florent, welcome and, and thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. Hello to all of you. I'm delighted to be with, with all of you. All right. Thank you. So before we get started, uh, Gary, I know you wanted to set a little bit of uh, the context of this conversation. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Yeah, thanks, Michele, and, and thanks, for, Aunt, for for joining us. And I have to say, I have Michelin tires on every one of my cars, so uh, I, I, I love the product as well. You know, I, I just want to talk for a moment to our viewers about why this is such an important conversation. You know, you know Michele described centralization like a ratchet, and, and it is. You know, the, the list of do's and don'ts for ordinary employees seems to grow ever longer o over time. And we know from a lot of surveys that in recent years, the, the autonomy that most employees have has, has shrunk rather than expanded. And, and in a, a process of intensive industry like, like tire making, where, where human lives are at stake, you need a lot of, of controls, you need a lot of standards. But, but those of you who've, who've worked in organizations, you, you know that, that kind of the ideology of controlism can take on a life of, of, of its own. And, and there's often an assumption that that uh, human beings can't be trusted to do the right thing and that without a lot of detailed protocols they'll in fact do stupid things and and the idea that more freedom might lead to employees doing smarter things often just uh, doesn't seem to occur to a lot of managers and so we assume that people are incapable of of making smart decisions or we assume that they might take advantage of their employer uh, if given the chance and, and unfortunately, those assumptions tend to be self-fulfilling and employees can retreat into a kind of a, a, a dull conformance or, 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 or kind of a, a sullen helplessness uh, uh, doing little more than the job requires. And, 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 and if you treat people like a factor production, um, you know, you end up finding that they, they, they bring to the job a little, little more ingenuity than a machine. So one of the things in, in the new human movement we believe deeply is that if we want to create better jobs. This isn't just about compensation and working conditions. It, it, it really starts with more agency and hence our conversation today. And I, I wanted to give that little setup because, you know, the, 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 the number of examples of organizations that have reversed that ratchet of control and have worked at it and continue to do so over years, that there are very, very few examples of where that's happened in a company of the size and scale of Michelin. So you're in for a treat. We're going to really be hearing at a different, about a different sort of unicorn, a, a management unicorn, if you, if you like. So let's, let's dig in and learn more from Florent. Excellent. I'm all yours. <laughs> all right. So maybe, Florent, let's, let's start from the beginning. And I think this goes back uh, at least a decade or almost a decade uh, with these early attempts at responsabilization that came in the midst of a, a big effort that Michelin uh, had underway uh, to roll out the Michelin manufacturing way, more protocol standards, and so on. And it seems that at the time there was this kind of nervousness or this concern that while, while it was understandable, the goal of, of leveling up and spreading best practices, there was kind of this anxiety that I think as, as one leader at the time said, maybe the company was losing its soul. So Perhaps give us a little context and tell us about the early stages, that, that awakening, and then the early stages to kind of say, can, can we reverse this ratchet? Yes, we, we, um, we, the, the movement of uh, responsabilization and, and uh, um, this empowerment to um, the field, the people, um, started a little bit more than 10 years ago at Michelin, because when we realized we had uh, more than 80 plants around the world, 
and that um, we knew we had to trust more the people in the field. So we started the journey, and actually it's, it all started in the US. And, and uh, we started in the US, and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because we didn't have the metrics. We were not clear about what we were expecting, and we didn't have truly a strategy uh, that was set so that so that that was understandable by everyone. And so so basically, uh, we started with this empowerment, and it failed. And um, and and when it failed, we we uh, we had two choices. So we had to put more control over more processes, and we thought it was uh, the processes that went right. So we have. We went through a period where it was a nightmare for everyone because you, you, we had set up new control, new bureaucracy uh, uh, everywhere to make sure that we would control every act of everyone up to a point where we couldn't move. It, we really, uh, our growth was stalled. We, we had uh, a lot of issues because everyone, but he, everyone was expecting somebody else to make a decision and up to a point where that somebody else I was turning myself and who is this somebody else? And, and, uh, and uh, uh, so we, 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 we started to say now, oh, no, it, it's not possible on the scale of Michelin. Uh, with uh, the pressure we have, we have to be more efficient. We have to be more productive. We have to, be, uh, we have to resolve more issues. Uh, we have more stakes. And, and imagining that only a few people can, can be the brain for an entire organization did not work. So we started to look into uh, the core of the issue and, and, uh, and suddenly it came very true when uh, the US manager I was uh, working with uh, told me one in the morning, um, uh, I was visiting the US and he said to me, uh, Florent, uh, I, I cannot understand um, why I'm working because working just for the value creation doesn't make any sense. And, and as he, he was asking that to me, I said, but, but Scott, his name is Scott Clark. He is now part of the board of Michelin. And, and uh, Scott, and I said, Scott, no, value creation is a survival kit. It is not the purpose. It is not why we do things. And then, and, and, and then he asked me this candid question about why are we doing these things? And then I realized that we, were, we had a lot of things missing and that we, we, we really had to give people a better sense of why we were together, what for they, they were working and what they should be doing. And if we, the, more, the clearer we would be on these basic things, then the people would uh, unleash all their potential, all their talent, everything. Then suddenly, when they understand what they have to do and why they have to do it, then suddenly whew, you had uh, fantastic opportunities everywhere. And, and uh, it started with Scott, and I started to explain to Scott why I, had, I, I joined Michelin and why and what for, what, what uh, we were doing together. And for him, it made a lot of sense. And then suddenly, this movement started everywhere. Then at the plant level, everywhere, we, we started that initiative to, to, to start explaining what people was, were working for. For what? And, and, and sometimes we, we say it's the why, but why doesn't give you what are you doing? Yeah, and, Florent, uh, can, I, uh, can I interrupt you there for a second? Because you're talking about a, uh, an effort of empowerment that preceded responsabilization. So this is something that happened, what, in the, in the, in the 2000s, right? In the year 2000, yes. We started yeah. in the year 2000 and then, and then it failed. Right. It fa and it failed because you gave people the, the autonomy, but, but not necessarily the, the, yes. the, the tools and the process. They did not understand why they would okay. get that responsibility for. Okay. They did not understand why why they would have to take that responsibility on board. Okay, and then- we were not clear what the expectations. Right, so then the reaction towards of, so then the, the, the Michelin Manufacturing Way, which is, if I can maybe put it this way, was a, a lean initiative, right? To kind yes. of 
get more efficiency, more um, uh, predictability, and so on from, from the manufacturing system. That came after this failed empowerment process. Yes. And as I understand it, it, it delivered results. So it you know, was better than sort of what, what preceded it. But it also it started to taper off where, yes. yeah, you were, you were squeezing the lemon as far as much as it could be squeezed and there was no more juice coming. And so exactly. <laughs> I, I think there's a dual pressure if I, if, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but one was, where's the next, you know, uh, curve of, of growth, you know, productivity growth coming from? And second, you know, we've, we've put our people under in a straitjacket and that's, you know, not only like the wrong thing to do f from an efficiency standpoint, but like from a human standpoint, g given your values and so on, yeah. you know, also unacceptable, right? Is that, is that fair? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely, because we created manufacturing, machine manufacturing way, MMW. Then we had a set of indicators. We were very thorough on, on things and we were giving a lot of tools and processes to help people make better decisions. But at the end, they have they had started to work for another process. And then so every every day they would come to work for MMW, which didn't make any sense. They they they, they suddenly the aim, the purpose was to feed MMW instead of using MMW as a tool to better do what they, they have to do. And, and uh, so suddenly this uh, tool that was uh, dis displayed in every plant and every workshop everywhere around the world was not efficient because the people did not understand what they were working for. So we had to step back and say, now, we are not going to throw away the, that tool, but we have to go one step beyond. And we have to explain the reason why they are there, the reason why we work together, what we want to do, what is our collective dream, what are we contributing to, and give them a, the perimeter of their responsibility, give them a frame saying, this within this frame, you can do everything you want, provided you respect the frame. And if you give a too narrow frame, the people would not do anything. But if you give a sufficient uh, a wider frame, suddenly people will start to be extremely intelligent. And then you start having a snowball effect. When you are very clear on, on what they have to do and why they should be doing these things, and you, you focus your management just to give answers to the people that are asking why they, they should be doing these things, then suddenly you would have a much more collective intelligence at play. One of the secrets is, is being clear about the, 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 the what, but not be trying to over-specify the how. And it, you never go into the how, never. Because what, what strikes me is a lot of these tools you are creating and giving people in a way you hoped that was going to lead to more autonomy, lead to smarter decisions, but probably it was just all over-specified. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like giving somebody Photoshop, it's an amazing tool, but then telling them exactly how they have to use it. And, you know, and you, you're kind of uh, uh, predetermining exactly what you want them to create with it. Yeah, absolutely. It was kind of ironic that this starts as an empowerment thing, but actually produced more bureaucracy and you had to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> That's exactly that. That's exactly that. Because we, we, we some, sometimes we underestimate the level of fear that have, uh, that is inside every manager. And the manager is so, um, has so much anxiety because he, he has a lot of pressure. He has to deliver results. He has uh, always conflicting objective, etc., to fulfill. So with this anxiety, he wants to, if he uses the process and, and, and the tools in one way, he wants everybody to do it the same way as he does it so that he can answer, he can, he can, he can replicate, he can, but that, that is just answering his fears, his anxiety. Uh, so and a lot, a lot of controlism, yes. uh, uh, that, that controlism you're saying comes out of anxiety. 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 Most of the time, every time, every time we, we, we go through a lot of process in the, in the group, Every time people are working for the process, it's because they are afraid of making decisions. They are afraid of the consequences of just listening to them and, uh, and, and uh, um, following their instinct. And, and sometimes they know much better 
they, they can do much better. And uh, so, so uh, now we explicitly talk about our fears. Uh, I talk about my fears and explain to my executive committee. I say, this is that I don't know how to do it and, and help me. And suddenly at the executive committee, the team just uh, carries the load on your behalf because they know they, they are more expert in different domains. And the same applies in the plants. So the plants now are plants around the world. They have no managers during the weekend. <laughs> they uh, now they are completely autonomous in terms of uh, digital uh, developments. We, we tell them this, these are the parameters. This is what has to be shared amongst plants, but on the rest, you can do what, what you think is relevant. This is the money you have. Now, this is your asset. Do as you would do at your home with your money. Do it. And, and, and we are amazed to see what they are able to perform. We, we see things, innovation and, and things really amazing. But it all starts with letting the manager express his real fears and then take that anxiety off him and let them go. And so very often the, the, the people in the shop floor, uh, they are afraid at the beginning to make decisions because they want to do good. All, all our people want to do good, but they, they are not trained. They are not used to do good in making their own decisions. And, that, and that's what we have to teach them. So maybe I could, you know, we could go back to the beginning. So you realize you wanted to make a shift. You realize you wanted to empower people, but you didn't, you know, call McKinsey or BCG or Bain to help you do this with a playbook, or you didn't go benchmark another company and say, hey, we're going to cut and paste their model and apply it to us, right? You, you, you took a very kind of clever and kind of experiment driven approach, uh, starting with a very small but representative slice, right, of, 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 of the manufacturing uh, employment base. So, so maybe you can talk a little bit about how this got started and and how then that led to to bigger things yes we we uh, we, we use consultants when uh, we we want to have benchmarks so we want to understand how others are doing and we, we did some some um, benchmarking and we did some surveys a, a, around the world uh, on companies that were in the same process and we, um, we there was toyota we, we did a lot of benchmarking uh, uh, among different companies. But at the end, we have a culture that is so strong at Michelin that I knew that it has to be owned by Michelin. If we want to achieve, especially a, a big transformation within Michelin, it has to be owned by Michelin and done by Michelin people that understand Michelin. So, so uh, and when you, 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 you ask a consultant, it's very difficult for the cons consultant to, to be your company, to, to be culturally fit. Um, he may pretend uh, they are very clever, they know many things, but you have to be Michelin. And, and right now we have, by the way, one key initiative called I Am Michelin. And this I Am Michelin is the, the uh, 4.0 uh, empowerment. It's, it's, it's just saying that everyone, what I'm saying to, say, saying to everyone right now is to say, everyone is the entire Michelin. Uh, whether at the shop floor, in the accounting department, if you don't believe your job is, is essential to Michelin, first of all, you should suppress your job. And second is your job is as indispensable as mine. Because the, the fact that you perform your job in the interest of Michelin every day is what makes Michelin successful. So, so at the end, every job is important. Whether you're a shop floor, whether you're a senior manager, I'm saying all of you are indispensable and you are Michelin. And if you behave on behalf of Michelin every day, then it's OK. The problem is, is when it's only the management that owns Michelin. It's not possible. So, so we, uh, we went through that process and, and uh, over time, I started to realize, I, start, I said, how do we move from stakes into action? And the problem, corporations have to move into action. If you do it through processes, you will obtain something. But basically, you, you consider people just as uh, tools, 
or equipment or machines. That's why we, we don't call, uh, we don't have a human resources department. We don't think humans are resources. We think humans are full of resources, which is completely different. So, so we, we, we have uh, people at the service of our personnel. So uh, we have a chief people officer. And that person is just to make sure that everyone is good. So, uh, I have, um, so I have used myself um, a coach. And, and we have systematically coached also the top 100 um, senior executive in the group to start telling them that we had to reverse everything. So we have the most important person probably was the people at the shop floor in the plant or in the field, in the selling, se selling, uh, uh, making the interface with the customer, etc. And that every, everything had to be so that they would know what they have to do. They would be empowered to make decisions. They would, they would have all the tools they need to make their job better. And all of them, if they had that, that responsibility of making Michelin overall, they would do great. So that's what we, that's what we did. Yeah. And what, uh, what I, I loved about how you started, which is I, if I remember correctly, you basically picked volunteer teams. You know, yes. so Michelin factories are basically organized in teams uh, that operate on, on, you know, the the assembly line. And there's a whole process of you know, taking raw materials in and then churning tires out, right, and shipping them. So each team fall, it takes takes a bit of that of that process. And and so what you did is you found teams, you know, for instance, the assembly team, right, or, or the curing team yes. and so on. And they said, oh, I and typically these teams are what, about 30 people? About you know we were 20, 24, yes, 28, yes, so that, 30 working in shifts, yes. right? So basically, you know, you don't have everybody there all the time, but you know, three shifts during the day of eight hours or something like that. But you basically found teams like that that were willing to experiment. They didn't necessarily yes. know what they were signing up for, but they wanted to. Both the supervisor and the team said, you know, we want to be more responsible, which means you know more more authority, but also more accountability. And right as I understand it correctly, you. you yeah. In the population, you always have the people that are really willing. Yeah. Then you have the people that are really against. And then you have the mass. So right. if you want to have an impact on the mass, you just have to take the people that are really willing right. and, and, and uh, apply the, the, the oil spill effect. One Ex spill exactly. of oil and then suddenly it expands. And, and so if you, if you force the process, then it becomes another process. Uh, empowerment becomes a process. And if empowerment is a process, it's a, it's a big problem. You understand how counterintuitive that is, for, I think, for a lot of leaders. Because the measure is, you know, if we're serious about this, let's roll it out. Let's, let's describe it. Let's put in all the metrics. You know, let's, 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 let's train people exactly. Let's roll this out. And as was McKinley was describing, you know, this this started after that early kind of failed attempt, as we understand it, very low key, where yes. where Patron Ballerin, uh, you know, who had worked in a factory and come to group, uh, 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 you know, uh, personnel was out, you know, visiting plants and looking for volunteers, looking for supervisors, saying, we really want to figure out, we, we want you to give your authority away. We want you to lead without that fear. We want to develop the capabilities of our people. Mm -hmm. And really looking for people who are willing to raise their hand and say, okay, I'll go with you on this at least a year long experiment. I know you're not giving us very much guidance. There's not, you know, and, and I still have to meet all my, my, my business objectives in my team. But I think that, that idea of, of starting, as you say, with, with the coalition of the willing, with yes. the people who are ready to do this and, and letting them teach the rest of the organization how to do it from the ground up. Rather than as typical, let's put a big process in, train everybody, make sure we're all doing it kind of in the new way. That that was pretty radical. Yeah, that was radical. And and Bertrand Ballarin, at that time, he was in charge of our uh, plant in, in Shanghai. And I remember I was um, his, his N plus two at that time. And I remember visiting that plant and it was a mess. That plant was a mess. And uh, Bertrand told me, Trust me, I'm going to fix it, but you have to leave me uh, two years. Um, so at the beginning, I was against. I was against. This plant was so messy. 
I was against. I said, I, I, uh, no. so, so, and, and, and he started to explain to me, no, 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 you, we have to trust the people. And uh, so we have to teach them to trust themselves. And, and if we do that, you know, uh, um, on, the, on a voluntary basis, you're going to see more and more people doing that. So I, I traveled a lot to China. And, and uh, at that time, so I was visiting more often this Shanghai plant and I was tr tracking what Bertrand was doing. And I, I had to recognize I was wrong. I said to Bertrand, you were right, I was wrong. It's the right, you, you have transformed this plant. And when I walk in the alleys of the plant, I see people that are seeking my eyes, that, 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 that want to talk to me rather than looking at their shoes and, and, and just avoiding contacts. Now I see people in the plant that are willing to talk to me and that are willing to ask questions that, that really want to be involved. And it, it did that. So what I did was, uh, I promoted, uh, we promoted Bertrand Ballarin upper in the group so that he can, he, he, he would take more volunteers in more plants and, and start, start that process. And then we asked him as well to, to share his experience and to look at his background and to see how do we have more oil spill effect so that we, 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 we drop more oil, oil everywhere around the organizations, then suddenly the entire organization will be covered. And, and we're still in the process, and it's not over. We are still in that process. Yeah, and I, I remember, I, you know, visiting Clermont-Ferrand, where Michelin is, is headquartered, and a lot of people are referring to the very strong engineering culture. So the, the notion that, that change in a plant is a social process, not necessarily an engineering process, or at least it's partly engineering, partly social, it was, you yeah. know, could strike people as counterintuitive. But, but as you say, Bertrand in the Shanghai J plant, demonstrated that and and then he recruited these uh units i think there were 37 teams in different plants so it was a, yes. about about less than 2000 people but the, the clever thing about what you did is that you spread these little activist uh, or you know uh, cells right uh, or you know yes. uh, teams of, for for change across the entire you know a large part of the footprint but in a way that wasn't very disruptive because these teams still had to deliver on their target Right, they they weren't just taking yes. offline, uh, and so they had to mm -hmm. kind of experiment their way into autonomy as they were doing their day job. So it was also, you know, not a threatening uh, change, you know, to to the plant managers and the industrial function mm -hmm. and so on, because like things would still have to have you know work the way they did. So so maybe can we fast forward that to the end of that year in which these these uh, uh, teams kind of uh, played around with autonomy. Um, and so it sounded, and then we have to, we, and then we yeah. connected all the teams together. Yes, we connected all the teams, so they they, they would have a free uh, exchange. So they would they would exchange, and they would cross fertilize themselves with their own experience. And then suddenly, and then we have worked on the managers because the managers they were seeing those empowered teams being successful. They felt uh, under threat because. They were not pushing this, so therefore, then, um, and we, we we have to manage this uh, anxiety from the managers. I think this is a crucial uh, in this process of uh, responsabilization. Is we have to manage the the legitimate anxiety of managers because the managers first is he, uh, he has a lot of uh, fear to let go to to give more power to uh, the teams, but then. If it's successful, then it says he was wrong. Then we have to help him managing. No, no, you were not wrong. It's a new era, so so it's okay. It's okay, and and uh, we all learning. So I made a lot of mistakes. So that's why I'm saying I, I, I was promoting everywhere. I was wrong in my uh, assessment of what Bertrand Valera was doing. I said publicly everywhere that I was wrong. I made a mistake because I did. I, what, where I was right, I let Bertrand do, do the stuff, but I was wrong because I did not believe it would be successful. So, and then we, you have to help people manage the fact that they have been, they are the fruit of their history. And, and uh, sometimes they have made mistakes and it's okay. It's okay. The most difficult things uh, in a corporation is to accept to make failures. Well, and, and every one of these managers, you know, the, that, that in that first round of experiments with these 37 or 38 teams, 
you know, they were really being, they weren't being told to do something. They were being invited to learn how to lead in any way to kind of make that, that jump from, from manager to mentor. And you really can't tell somebody how to do that. You know, it takes, it takes experience. It takes practice. As I remember, some of these leaders were asking their teams to follow them around and, and learn what they were doing as managers. And then to ask which of these activities could we manage ourselves within our team. Yes. But the one, the one thing that was striking to us from as, as, as we talked to some of these leaders is even though they started with that position of fear, their jobs got better as well because they were no longer having to micromanage other people. They could work on more interesting problems. Yeah. You know, they, they weren't being woken up in the third ship with, you know, a trivial issue to solve. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think we, we, we underappreciate the time it takes for people to kind of unlearn one way of managing and to move into that new model. Absolutely, it, it takes it takes a long time. This 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 kind of um, um, cultural shift take a long time. It's a long process, and we are not over. Far from being over right now. It started more than ten years ago, and and uh, but we are making now. We we have developed in the plants a, a kind of holocracy. So now we have connected different plants. So instead of connecting just teams. Now we have plants that are moving much faster. So we are connecting plants together and they create sort of a, a small island of, uh, they talk directly to each other and resolve problem now within each other without involving the hierarchy. And it's only when they are unable to resolve a problem that they activate the hierarchy and that they go to uh, the regional supervisor and things like that. But it's only when you have problems. So, so now we have shifted the senior leadership into problem solving rather than trying to energize and trying to obtain stuff. Uh, it, it is more what we're saying is that when the energy is not there, it's because we are not taking care of the people. It's probably because so, we're badly, bad, badly taking care of that. In one plant in France, and there is this quote I like that was written by the shop floor people in a meeting room. They have put it in uh, big letters in a meeting room. They say, the manager is there to take care of us. We take care of the rest. I think this summarizes everything. And I like a lot this quote because it says the manager has to take care of the people. Make sure that the people are happy with what they're doing. They understand what they have to do. They, they have the tools to do what they have to do. And then help them resolve things that are beyond uh, what they can do. So some, some things are more related to a process, to uh, uh, new tools and things like that. So that's the manager to take, to take, to understand and to take on behalf of the people. Let me, let me go back. We have to circle back to that as well. That's a beautiful quote. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, that, that really is, that comes kind of close to inverting the pyramid when you think about it, doesn't it? Uh, and it really says, you know, that, 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 that accountability flows down as much as yes. it flows up. Yes. But, but for all, I want to take you back uh, to a meeting, I think it was in December of 2013. This experiment of responsabilization had been running, for, I guess, for about a year. And Bertrand comes and, and, and comes, gets on the agenda of the executive committee to talk about what you're learning. Uh, as you describe these, these uh, uh, different teams that now come together and started to collate all the things they were learning about how do you give your authority away. And in that meeting, at least this is what we picked up. Apparently, you said the following. I'll paraphrase. You said, you, you said, this is, this is a very powerful way of working, and it can help Michelin become the company we aspire to be. Yes. So what did, what did you mean by that? What struck you in that that resonated, obviously, quite deeply in your heart? Yeah. Um, it was, there was a, um, very often you, you get paradox in the, in the corporations, and, or you get uh, conflicting. So we are fundamentally a, a human being corporation. We, we do things to help humanity's progress, but our behaviors <laughs> were completely con con contradictory to that. And basically we were uh, forbidding, we were controlling, we were impeaching, we were, we were really uh, trying to, to force people in doing things. And rather than, than, than um, starting from the, the, the profound idea that 
human beings are there to make progress. We are born to make progress. We like, as human beings, to do innovative things. We, 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 we are programmed as human beings to progress. So therefore, when we don't do that, it's because something is, is uh, forbidding that to happen, rather than trying to energize constantly the people. To, uh, when, when somebody is lacking in energy, it's not because, it's because surrounding are not helping him to do what he wants to do. So it's better to focus on why he's not doing the things rather than than trying to force him to do to do things. So so at this meeting in the executive committee, I said we have to be aligned with our purpose. Our purpose is we care about giving people a better way forward. It is not provide creating the best process in the world. That's not, that's not uh, the thing. The thing is, how do we allow people to be who they are? And, and, and how do we make sure that we do not create an organization that is forcing people to do what they are not born to do? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very deep thought and, and one that, you know, it sounds like a simple shift in perspective, but it's actually quite profound. And, and if you take that perspective as you did, it then informs and gives you confidence that to persevere and continue, right? Because the journey went from from that meeting at the executive committee, where I guess Bertrand and the, and the team, uh, the empowerment team, got the green light from from you and your colleagues to to go bolder, right? So to go instead instead of just working on autonomy at the level of a team, it was more, you know, it was at the level of a plant. So can you talk a little bit about the the? And I know we're not going to do justice to this, Florian, because we don't have a lot of time. But if you talk about the highlights of, of that progression, so how you went from team to plants and autonomy at the plant level, and then how that then created pressure to change how the functions interacted with the plant. Yes, yes. After, um, so in 2013, we, we displayed the, the group purpose. And then we, had, we, we started the process to work, and I started personally to work on a group-wide strategy. The, the strategy at that time was, the sum up of the business entities strategy. We didn't have really a, a group strategy. So uh, I started to work on that. But then, then the plants were moving very fast. They were developing very innovative. And then suddenly they started to, to say, but I could do the product differently. And now you have to deal with the research team that are now developing the product you, to, to, to tell them that the plant is telling you that they could do it better, faster, cheaper uh, than what you have proposed. So now we have to work to protect the plant from the research department because, because they, these guys will not be happy to have the plant telling them how to do it. To do it. Then the quality people, then, then suddenly a lot of different departments would have to change because the plant were moving very fast. So as the plant were developing, and now it's not only the plant, the group of plants now were starting to develop themselves and they were starting to run very fast. The level of, uh, we measure every year, uh, we, we, uh, we ask uh, so, um, 100, 100 questions to or 124,000 people. The group to, to measure the level of uh, engagement. Now the plants are much higher than the people in the office. And it wasn't because that way. It wasn't that way before, right? It was not that, that way. Yeah. When, when the office was at 80, scoring 80 out of 100, the plants, the shop floor, they were at 50, 52, 53. So it, it, now the plants are, a plant in Thailand is at 98. Can you believe it? The shop floor, every, everybody, you have 1,400 people, they run extremely fast. They, they invent things every day. They do a perfect job. The, the plant performance is excellent. And the guys are much more committed than the executive committee of the group. So, so it's, it's, it's amazing to, to, to see that shift. And it happened in, in, um, in um, seven years. So that's the more empowerment you give, the more people, the more commitment you get from the people. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. There's more of it to come. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire the world's largest appliance maker and a global leader in the Internet of Things 
for underwriting the costs of producing this interview. It's great to work with a partner who is so deeply committed to building organizations that elicit and deserve the very best that human beings can give. Now, back to our conversation. Well, and Florent, what, what I think is very interesting, and I don't know if this was by design or just it was like lucky, lucky happenstance, but basically, and I think it was by design, that what you did is you created at each level autonomy, which then pressured the level above to adjust, yes. right? Yes. And it just, it was, it was, it was uh, 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 in a way, like a reverse ratchet because, you know, there's this built-in pressure. You know, I remember we're talking to the general manager of the Polish plant in uh, Olsen, and he was saying, well, you know, we're not responsible for delivering products to our customers. You know, as we do that, we should be in charge of determining whether the product meets the quality standard. I don't have to go to Clermont-Ferrand and get their permission. So, like, yes. I need to talk to the, the quality department and say, can you give me the authority to do this? And again, it was, I think they did it in a very clever way where they said, well, give us a few things that we can make quality decisions on. We'll do this for a month. And if you think we make bad decisions, we can, we can take it back. Right. And Absolutely. it turns out they That's were exactly very close. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's a, instead of trying to kind of resolve this all once and for all, where you have to persuade everybody to give up power in some sort of abstract way, this is what makes it very real, very tangible and very difficult to resist. Right. Because there is the evidence that this can be done. And so like the quality department can't say, well, they can't do it. No, no. They've just demonstrated to you in an experiment that they can. So the, the burden is on you to kind of keep yeah. power. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly something we did where I've suppressed the Rachi. Because the Rachi is a sort of putting people in boxes. And when and, and because you're in R, you're in A, you're in C or in I, actually in the environment, you start to see that uh, the boundaries are shifting, moving, and, and uh, it depends whether the plant is, when, when a plant or a country is very clear on what it has to do, let, it, let him do it. Don't define if it's just for information, for decisions. So, the, and that's, that's back to this uh, I am Michelin uh, prospect. I always ask them before you take a, a decision, go through an advice process. Make sure that you inquire within the group whether somebody has already worked on, on this thing and, and exchange with, with him or ma make sure that uh, you inform. A lot of people uh, on what you do, but then if you convince it's good for the group, do it. Uh, don't wait for authorizations. If you think it's good for the group, not for your entity, not for you, but for the group, then do it. And and um, I'm amazed to, to see the, the the quality of the level of, and the, the level of decisions they're making is really amazing. And so now we 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 have entered. Um, over the past two years into coaching the executive committee collectively to make sure that we would be up to the level of, of our organization now. Because, because they, they, we, we have to make sure that we do not, through our policies, our principles, our regula the regulation, we, we, uh, the, the instruction we give at the executive committee, we, 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 we start creating issues with this environment. So, and, and so we, we went through an exercise at the executive committee to make sure that we would be up to this empowerment task. And, and actually we have redefined because of that, we have redefined what is the, the mission of the executive committee. And we have said at the executive committee, sometimes, you know, the chicken and the egg, sometimes the executive committee is counting the eggs and looking at the quality of the eggs, etc. And we're saying, no, no, no. If you want to have good eggs, take care of the chicken. So we take care of the chicken. We don't take care of the eggs and we, we, by taking care of the chick, the chicken, we know we will have good eggs. So it was a very big shift in the executive committee as well, collectively to say, we are going to be really looking after whether people are happy. They know what they have to do. They know what they work for. Um, they know why they work together. Uh, and, and sometimes if the performance is not there, it's probably because they have not understood something rather than they are bad people. They, 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 uh, and now the next step is we have to retrain. We have to, uh, to, um, uh, we are creating a, a new, we, we call it a talent factory because we want to, uh, help everybody in the organizations to 
get up to its talent. And very often, we underestimate the talent available in every, in every, every everyone. So, so as a, a, a corporate initiative at the executive committee, we, we take care of this um, talent factory. We, we want to redesign the way we train, the way we accompany the, 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 the people and the talent development uh, because of that. So, so yes, it, it has put this empowerment starting from the field has put pressure up to the entire organization. So, so I, the, boy, there's a couple of questions that you're stimulating for and I want to ask you about. So one of the assumptions we often make about like a change program, it's a classic assumption, is that change has to start top down. And that doesn't mean that there's just some like permission, but that it really has to be orchestrated, plotted out and so on. This whole initiative seemed kind of much more kind of bottom up. Uh, clearly there were people at the top that knew what Bertrand and others were doing and, and, and so on. But here's my question. So you said just recently you've been having this conversation at the executive committee about how do we need to change our role. What would have happened or how feasible would it have been a decade ago if you said, rather than start with these demonstrator teams in the plants, let's like get all of our, you know, our most senior, most powerful executives together and try to get like, try to produce a mindset shift. Let's just try to get them all to say, okay, we're, we're willing to be less bureaucratic. We're going to give some of our authority away. Would, would that have been very productive or did you need first to see this, to see people stepping up, to have confirmation that people have these hidden talents? Because I, I just wonder whether, whether you, you could have done this in that old way or it had to more bubble up in the way it did. Yeah. Um, I don't have the answer because we, we did it differently. So, so I don't know, but, 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 but now every time I have a counter argument with uh, somebody from the executive, the executive committee or a senior manager about this empowerment. I can refer to, I say, look, go there, watch what they're doing and come back and, and we talk. And if you really think that uh, it's, it's the wrong way of doing things, come back. None, so far, none have come back. So now if I had to explain this movement, um, it would be difficult because it's, it's um, um, every plant is different. Every um, level of maturity is different within the organization. So, so if you, of course, I could have convinced uh, the people, but um, not all the people I was working with were convinced. Um, and therefore, it would, would have been, uh, and then it would have been a, a very theoretical because uh, the first, uh, as, especially when um, you, you have bad results, that's the, the biggest problem is when you have a bad result, then the guy that is not convinced will come back to you and tell you, I told you it was wrong. That's why we have bad results. Now let's go back into command and control. Boom. The old, more, very reassuring way, etc. Now, <laughs> When something goes wrong, very, we, we don't go through that command and control. There are, there are here and there are some senior managers that are more comfortable with that. And I tell them, are we sure that we will have a better solution than what the people are doing in the field? Are we sure that they had all the means to do what they needed to do? Are we sure that they were clear on what we were expecting out of them? And very often we don't have those, uh, those questions right. So therefore, before we go back into the command and control, we say, Ooh, let's be very cautious. Um, so, so yes, I, I, um, I, I tried to actually to work both ways um, and, and everywhere. Actually, it was laterally and then upward, downward and from everywhere. Now, we focus more now on the executive committee on, on the, the um, um, we, we want to take more symbolic um, um, posture and we want to be exemplar on this empowerment. So we, we just want to make sure that we help the organizations to, to do what it does on its own now, because a lot of things are now self developing and we, we try not to create boundaries. We try not to, um, at this stage, we, we have not set limits to this empowerment. We say now we have uh, plans now that are deciding the level of um, um, uh, payment they want to make 
to the union guy in their team. And the union guy in the team says, yes, I agree. I, I do not deserve that, that amount of money because uh, I, I spent more time on stuff that was not directly uh, productive in the, in the team, in the, in the plant. That I could not orchestrate from, from the central. It's the team, the teammates, uh, they, they, they are now in charge of uh, developing what should be the size structure in the plant. They do it much better than what we could do it uh, from the central. You know, for, uh, I think uh, it's a very compelling example of what you've done. And in this series of interviews we've been doing, we also uh, talked to Zainab Tan at MIT. She's leading a very interesting piece of research around good jobs and has done uh, a lot of, uh, has, has studied hundreds and hundreds of organizations. And, and what's interesting is what Michelin is doing is still incredibly rare, despite the fact that when you look at companies that, that have, have done this, who've turned on the problem-solving skills of their people at all levels, they outperform, everything gets better. And yet it is still extremely rare. Uh, uh, she focuses particularly on, on retail. And for every example of, of a company like Costco, which has done this quite well, you find other you know, big retailers that continue to treat frontline people like a factor production. Yeah. So, and, and we can make up many reasons why, 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 why Michelin's example is, is not more frequent but, uh, or, or more typical. But if you were speaking at Davos, so you were speaking to some other group of CEOs, and they're saying, Florent, you know, we have all this pressure from shareholders. You know, you, you've been working at this for 10 years and more. We don't have that kind of time to do something like that. Or they're going to say, we have all these compliance uh, challenges now from the regulators and so on. We can't take the risk of, of giving people more autonomy. How, how would you convince a skeptical CEO or simply one who's still very comfortable operating out of that old model, who believes that, you know, the reason people pay me all this money is so I make the big decisions and I need to be seen to make the big decisions. Mm -hmm. How do you start to unlock that? That Because that's our collective challenges, you know, to take what Michelin is doing. And, you know, we want to see hundreds, thousands of organizations on this journey. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to your peers? Uh, first, I have a, a U.S. example. Um, I am in contact right now with uh, Hubert jo uh, Jolie from uh, Best Buy. He did it at Best Buy. And uh, he's now coaching uh, leaders. Uh, um, uh, he, he has uh, uh, retreated from uh, Best Buy now and, uh, and he's coaching. Uh, he's coaching leaders towards that. And we have frequent exchanges and we agree um, on, many, on many things. Now, again, on the how, the how, is, is different within every organization. But the how and the what, the, the what and the how, the why and the, sorry, the, the why and the how, the what, then that we can share. The why, if you want your organizations to be there for the next century, you better change things because, uh, and, and we, when, we, when we started, I recognized that the group Michelin was not growing, had not grown for the past 10 years. And it was scaring me because I said, I'm, we are in huge restructuring, huge problem if we are not careful because not growing within an organization is a problem. It's also a recognition that in the market, we are not making an impact because we are not growing. So th therefore, I had the sense of, of urgency. We had to do something different. And the, the route, that's, what, that's why we took that, um, that journey. Now, what I would say to the managers, of course, I have a lot of pressure from the investors. <laughs> they, 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 they don't give me a gift. Uh, and, and I say, uh, but I know how people would succeed. And I've, in a, the strategy I've defined, I've said, now, corporations that will succeed in the future are the ones that are going to be able to work on the three Ps at the same time. People, planet, profit. If you have a disequilibrium within these three dimensions, you, you're in major trouble in the future. So if you, the profit, the people, 
would work under pressure to do 100, but if they do it on their own for themselves because they want to develop themselves, they will give you 500. <laughs> and, and very basic, very simple. So, of course, I want to deliver the results. I need to deliver the results, otherwise I would be fired. And it's logical, but I would not do it at the expense of people. We're doing it through people. People have, are the ones that are doing Mishnah every day. It's not me, it's everyone, including me. I have a part, they have a part, uh, uh, everyone has a part. And, and again, if you give them why we want to grow, where we want to go, what we, we are doing, they are going to give you much more than what you were even imagining that was possible. And I see now, uh, when I see people, uh, I see people that are happy to come to work. If they are happy to come to work, um, even sometimes on very difficult tasks, uh, very um, demanding uh, uh, in terms of strength and, and in some, some jobs in the plants are not uh, that fancy, but they understand why they want to do it. And they, and they, they, have, the, they have the feeling that they contribute to something and that it's much bigger. Uh, and, and that goes beyond the, the, the just a task. And uh, w when somebody in the plant is manufacturing a tire, you would see the attention he pays to what he does because he knows that the safety um, of somebody else is at stake if he doesn't do it well. But he knows also that his salary, his growth, his development is dependent upon the fact that he's very productive. So he works with his teammates to be as productive as possible and to solve as many problems. And, and very often he has many problems. The machines will not work, etc. So he's happy to see his entire management team at his service to solve the issues that he has with the machine, with the stuff, so that we, we unleash stress out of him. We, we take out stress. Yeah. What you're saying, what you're saying, Florian, is that uh... It's, you know, some CEOs might think it's a trade-off, you know, between humanizing the organization and delivering results, which is saying, no, 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 it's not that it's not a trade-off. It's, it's how you deliver results, right? So, yeah, so, so, so get on with it. Well, so one thing, I know we're drawing uh, to a close here, but I wanted to squeeze one more question for Ron, and it really is about something you alluded to throughout this conversation, sort of your, your own shift in, in leadership and, and, and your conception of your role as a leader and you know uh, um i read a recent interview you you gave to a french magazine and i want to quote you here and get your you to react and for i hope i translated this from, from french properly but you said something like uh quote i began to make progress when i accepted my weaknesses because for me courage starts when you face your fears if i could go back in time i would talk a lot less and, a, and listen a lot more and then you went on to say that quote as a leader I must especially not become indispensable, otherwise I become a blocking element. My role is to give energy to people so that they can trust each other and to eliminate what prevents them from exercising their talent. So it's, I think you kind of alluded to some of this uh, before, but I wanted to kind of share that quote, which I found really inspiring and powerful. And I'd love if you could to maybe just say a little bit more about how your views of leadership and your own behaviors have evolved throughout this journey. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, for me, um, being um, a senior leader is very demanding today. We have a lot of issues to resolve. We have a lot at stakes. We have many, a lot of pressure. And uh, really, uh, so, so uh, we have to show, to display courage. And courage, everybody, when they go, go to work, has to display courage. And even people at the shop floor have display, to display courage. But courage is not to hide your fears. Courage is when you face your fears and you say, okay, I'm okay with it. I am going to manage it. I am going to work with it. So uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm not complaining. I say, okay, I understand who I am. I think I understand who I am because it's very complex, but uh, you, human beings are a universe on their own. So, so, but I know very often, I, I, uh, when I've started to confront my fears, 
I started to understand why I was asking the question this way, why I was stressing people, why I was, because I was stressed myself. So now I'm better understanding the impact I'm having on somebody else. And therefore I'm able to adjust and say, okay, now you should know that the reason why I am stressed right now is because I have this fear and you're not answering that fear. So it's, it, the conversation gets better because the person can adjust. If I tell him why I'm behaving like that, rather than just letting the emotion there. So I worked a lot on understanding, not hiding my emotions. I'm trying to understand where they're coming from. And I start working with that and, and dis discussing with the people I'm discussing with to, to help them. And while I'm doing that journey, they're doing the, their own journey. And the relationship starts when everybody is, is at ease with, right, readily at ease with where they are, who they are, and then start entering into relationship. Because we then the power struggle is not in the way. And very often in, a, in our corporations, the issue comes from the power struggle. I have nothing to demonstrate than just I'm going, giving my best every day for Mishnah to help people develop themselves. And, and, and that's my, I have no power. I have no, <laughs> I have nothing to demonstrate. I have, I would have succeeded if the organization is more collectively intelligent, then, then that's my, my, my success. And, 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 and my success will not be my success. It's, it's the people's success. I we just have helped a little bit that process to be, to be there. So, so, we worked and I worked a lot on myself and, and the journey is not over yet. I have many, uh, many things to work on, uh, but I, I, I share and I, I, with the executive committee, the senior leaders, I share when I don't know, I say, I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe you know better than I do and it's okay. Uh, and I'm, I am not paid to know everything. That's something also I've learned when I was younger. I thought being a manager, I had to know everything. It's a big mistake, <laughs> big mistake. Now, I, uh, today, I, I, I work with people that are much more competent than I, than, than I am, much more, much more. And it's, it's okay. Now, what I give, can give them is my experience, my, uh, my learnings, I, my questions, my, my uh, feelings, uh, my uh, understanding of things. And that's w where we progress much faster and much better than, than being the... Uh, the reference, the thing. So the organizations, if, if I am indispensable to the organization, it's the big weakness because then the organization, if I fall on the stairs and I'm unavailable for three months, the company stops. It's, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, it's much better if I work with people. I'm, I'm working right now. The day I was um, uh, appointed uh, a CEO, I started to work on my succession plan my personal succession, identifying who is the best person to uh, succeed me. How do I grow that person to, so that he can develop himself into the job? Um, and maybe it's one, two. Uh, so that's my first task is to make, is to make sure that uh, if I disappear tomorrow, the, the, the organization survives. It's a big problem when you have a, a guru at the head of a corporation, and then it, be, it becomes in a disarray when the, that person disappears. It's a big problem. And, and there, I've inherited a company that, I, that is 130 years old. My job is to make it <laughs> sustainable for the next century. You know, Farah, I, I just have to say uh, thank you for all of our, our, our listeners, our viewers. Uh, what is a masterclass on what it means to be a leader today and putting the planet and, and profit and people uh, uh, at, at the head of the agenda. And I, and I think you're saying, you know, people really have to come first. They care about the planet as well. If you take care of them, the profit will follow. I, I also just want to underline this point you're making about not, not, not trying to make yourself indispensable because, you know, there's so much anxiety today in organizations. People feel their jobs are constantly at risk. And one of the ways, you, you know, many, many leaders, many managers, you want to be indispensable. You want people to believe that you're the only one with the facts. You're the only one who is qualified to make this decision. And, 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 
and 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 you've really given us, I think, another way of of thinking that that the indispensability comes from being in service to others, and as you said, helping to build that collective intelligence. So, uh, Fla- thank you so much for taking the trouble and the time. Uh, we'll put a link. Uh, as you know, we wrote a story about uh, Michelin for Harvard Business Review. We'll make sure we get a link in there so people can learn more about Michelin. Please go out and read about what's happening there. It's quite a, a powerful and compelling story. And we, we just wish you the best and the best for Michelin on, on, on the journey of responsabilization. So thank you so much. It, it, was, a, it was a pleasure. And if, just if I have one minute, I can just rebond on, on your conclusion on, to say that if I am indispensable, if I think to be a senior leader, I have to be indispensable, is because I, I will not face my fear, the fear, the fear of not being competent. It's, it's okay. I have no fear on that. I have a fear that you don't like me or that you uh, may think I'm not competent, but it's okay. You have your own judgment. You you have, uh, and the corporation should not be um, relying on flaw. <laughs> so thank you so much. Words of wisdom to the end. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers and listeners. Thank you. Thank you.